In 1896, a zoologist went to Africa and sat in a cage to observe gorillas in their natural environment. He didn't learn much. Now, throughout the world, several hundred gorillas are resigned to sitting in their cages to watch humans. I should like to know what goes on in their minds when they peer out at a public who, for the most part, don't really understand the true nature of the species. The gorilla, in actuality, is a very gentle giant, and they have become everyone's favorite horror monster and scapegoat. For this reason, I would like to correct that erroneous impression by sharing with you some of the results of my observations of the free-living mountain gorilla. The name gorilla comes from a Greek translation of the findings of a 5th century BC navigator, Hanno. Hanno found an island on the west coast of Africa upon which dwelled hairy savages, most of whom were females and were therefore called gorillae. Twenty-three more centuries of myths and legends were to pass before the authenticated discovery in West Africa in 1847 of the lowland gorilla. There is indirect evidence to suggest that at some time during the late Pleistocene, the gorilla did exist as one continuous population from West to Central Africa. But when the forest regressed, the intervening population had become depleted. Today, approximately 650 miles separate the two main subspecies. Of the subspecies, the mountain gorilla was first discovered only in 1901. Now classified as a rare animal, there is a possibility that the mountain gorilla may become extinct within the same century as it was discovered. Official protection for the gorilla was first granted in 1929 when the Parc National Albert was created within the Virunga Mountains, the last stronghold of the mountain gorilla and the home of the gorillas whom you will meet tonight. Man is the gorilla's worst enemy. Due to man's encroachment into his dwindling terrain, the mountain gorilla is forced to reside within an increasingly higher altitude, his range boundaries being constantly threatened by habitat destruction. Hopefully, more stringent measures will be undertaken to protect that remarkable species, the mountain gorilla. In Central Africa, at the base of the Albertine Rift, there exists the classical home of the mountain gorilla. Indeed, some authorities feel that the species evolved within this area, just north of Lake Kivu. There is a volcanic mountain range some 48 miles in length, which forms part of the boundary between Zaire, Uganda, and Rwanda. The Virunga mountain range consists of eight peaks, two, are active and do, are not frequented by a gorilla. The remaining six dormant volcanoes lay 25 miles from east to west. Mount Fasoki is the center of the study area and slightly over 12,000 feet in height. It is separated from the other mountains 
by bamboo hills and the gentle rolling saddle area of Hagania Woodland. Half of the mountain lies in Zaire and the other half within Rwanda. Census work has shown 274 animals living within 29 groups within the Virunga Mountains. The animals frequent the saddle area and also the high slopes of all of the volcanoes. I have contacted gorillas beyond 13,000 feet. Within the rich mountain forest, rain falls steadily, in fact 65% of the year, for a per annum total of 65 inches. Creeks and streams will swell to become small rivers, which the gorilla seldom venture to cross. Fog is also commonplace and it does hinder observations. It has been known to disorientate guerrilla groups when they are trying to explore new terrain and lose sight of their mountains. Erosion progresses on a yearly basis with the scant dirt covering on top of the lava of a mountain being washed off. Hail is also commonplace and forms a very harsh contrast with the more delicate flowers of the woodland. Because of the high altitude and the very, very cold evenings, morning frost is constantly seen and forms a delicate pattern amongst a network of vines and leaves in the forest. If the frost is very heavy, it destroys a big percentage of gorilla food, such as seen on these herbaceous slopes. The forest home of the gorilla is being reduced. Once far vaster than it is now, it has no buffer zone and will meet the onslaughts of civilization. Rwanda, with a population of 163 people per square kilometer, is the most densely populated country in all of Africa and indeed one of the heaviest cultivated. Because of the population pressure, the forest reserves and watersheds are constantly being sacrificed to meet the need for land. Fields of corn, pyrethrum, and tobacco extend all the way to the edges of the mountain. Six years ago, on this very road which goes to the base of Mount Vesoki, there was only a jungle of dense bamboo. In fact, I used to make contacts with a gorilla on this very spot. Porters are red readily available from the nearby villages. For the most part, they are very fine Bahutu, people of Rwanda. They will willingly take my loads up to camp, which is nearly a 2,000 foot climb. The trail we use to go to camp is an old elephant and buffalo trail. We leave civilization behind us and go into the heartland of the mountains. In 1967, when looking for a place to establish my research uh, center from another volcano and through binoculars, I saw this area and it looked very promising to me. During the first two years, camp only consisted of two tents, one for myself and one for two Africans I had hired to help me. Then, because of the inclement weather, I felt that I had to build a tin cabin as a means of protection. It was not very sightly, but far more comfortable. The early days of the study were tremendously challenging and rewarding in their own way. Every morning when starting out for work, I really didn't know what the day's observations would bring. 
I didn't know for how long or how far I would have to go to find the gorilla. Furthermore, I was never sure of what their reaction to me would be. Despite my well-meaning intentions, I was an intruder into the gorilla terrain. Everything fled. The small forest diker. The gorilla only had known humans in the form of poachers or herdsmen. Therefore, it was easy to understand their initial fear and apprehension when I first sought to make contacts with them. Their usual approach was to retreat swiftly and silently, especially if I were at some distance. They thought this kind of a retreat would not give their location away. I could be rewarded then only by the smell of a silverback, a very strong, penetrating odor indicating fear. After hours of walking, this would be the result. My observations did not amount to much. These days were a bit frustrating. Tracking or following the trail of a group through deep fo foliage was informative. Gorillas build night nest each night in a different spot. Since they're not active during the night, a good count of these nests provided an idea of how many animals were within each group and also gave me an idea of the age sex composition of each group as well as what they ate. Finally, I was rewarded by a different type of response. Termed response behavior, it was meant to intimidate with chest beats and vocalizations. It was all bluff. At least they were finally holding their ground, and it meant that I could see more of them, whilst other animals still were fleeing within the forest. Two years after the study began, I acquired Coco and Pucker, two juveniles captured by the Rwandese for a European zoo. They were quite sick, so I took them to camp for a three-month convalescent period. I took them out for daily excursions into the forest once they had regained their health. And this was a time for me of learning. I learned much from them, especially in the way of grooming, feeding, vocalizations, and play behavior. Coco and Pucker were far more active on days when the sun was shining than they were on the usual foggy overcast days. I came to know their need for love and attention. Cindy, the camp mascot, really got the worst of it during their play sessions. After a good day's romp in the forest, both juveniles, Coco and Pucker, were ready to return to camp, providing they got a lift, of course. <laughs> when Coco and Pucker were taken away and to their zoo, I resumed my studies in the field with the wild animals, much more knowledgeable than I had previously been. There is one vocalization learned from Coco and Pucker, 
which relaxes the animals. They all responded to it. Sometimes it didn't work. <laughs> this young male, having expressed his doubts about my intentions, symbolic feeds, a displacement symptom that means uh, something not really pertinent to the uh, situation at hand. He's slightly nervous and apprehensive, but does relax with the imitative behavior. This kind of imitation on my part prolonged the observations because it elicited the curiosity and the interest. Come on, lady, you can't really like that stuff. Still, he's acting in an artificial manner, and it was not the type of behavior I had come to observe and to record. After a long while, there just ended up the curiosity. Then the animals would resort to their normal behavior, which would they had been doing before I encountered them. However, on certain occasions, <laughs> he doesn't seem to understand how he's tolerating the presence of the human. But what's a fellow to do? The animals were never followed during these days to ease their own contentment. I found the youngest animals to be by far the most outgoing and forward. Curiosity again blended in with a shyness. They seemed to welcome my presence, but at the same time were aware of their own looking at me. The juveniles were the extroverts in gorilla land. Their behavioral tactics always showed, made more attention to themselves. They wanted everyone to look at me. I'm the king of the castle. The exaggeration of facial expressions, body movements, and locomotion was seen only in the juvenile class. Many times there seemed to be an inner conflict between coming to the observer to show off or thinking about Mama, who was always behind in the foliage hiding. One more time. Mama did not like this. Maternal discipline is not usually expressed overtly. But this time, instead of just glancing at her infant, the mother decided she had to pull him off the log. For a while, it seemed as though he was going to comply with her wishes. <laughs> he does have a mind of his own. If human parallels must be made between primates and ourselves, his name might be Dennis the Menace. After most artificial behavior had become dispensed with, then the normal activities such as feeding could be properly observed. Feeding occupies most of a gorilla's day, 
and I found that there was a complex spatial relationship involved in feeding. The more intense the feeding, the wider the spacing, each animal with its own garden plot. This female objects to my proximity, slaps down foliage. She will also do that if another gorilla comes too close to her. Selection plays an important part in the enjoyment of feeding uh, foliage. And they spend a great deal of time picking out their various plants, such as the one that you see now, the thistle. You and I would not care to touch, but it's the basic staple of the gorilla's diet. Its thorns and spines don't seem to bother the gorilla at all with their thick calloused hands. They strip the leaves adroitly. All parts of this plant are eaten, the roots, the stem, and even the flower. The infants or youngsters don't have quite the adaptability that the adults have when they pluck a leaf off. They respect it. They push it far in the back of their mouths so to avoid damaging the front part or the more tender lips. The younger the infant, the more care is taken in the manipulation of the plant. Looking at scenes like this, I wonder if this, uh, gorilla, uh, the thistle is not the spinach of the infant gorilla's world. The virulence of the nettles is such that they will burn through two layers of clothing and cause the observer painful blisters and welts. Walking through a nettle field in this country is a memorable experience as they grow as high as an elephant's eye. Even the young gorillas are wary of them, and they treat them with extreme caution. The gallium vine is the second most favored plant amongst the gorillas with its barbed undersides and hooks. This vine grows at all levels of the forest and interwound among the forest floor plants. It is stripped out and wadded into a gallium sandwich, the McDonald of the gorilla world. The younger animals don't have too much trouble in obtaining this plant. They take out the discard or the unwanted portions, both orally and manually. Gorillas are basically vegetarians, although they have been observed to eat snails, worms, larvae. The gallium also goes high in the trees. And here a female is pulling out a gallium salad. She is holding her infant ventrally. Infants learn to eat solid foods at the age of a month and a half. And the gallium is the first vine or food plant in which they take because they find the discards on their mother's bellies and stomachs. Here a fine old silverback is munching on a stalk of celery. One of the more popular items that most people know about existing in these mountain areas. Celery looks like our celery, but it grows to be eight feet tall. It tastes rather bitter to me. Here a young animal is deftly stripping off the outer peeling so as to get to the tender, pulpy bit for a celery lollipop. There is a great deal of moisture in the food plants of the gorillas, therefore they do not need to drink water, though they've been observed to do so. 
selection plays a big part. Again, this animal is looking for a piece of thistle, which might look alike to you and I, but not to him, apparently. He selects one plant, one lovely bouquet of thistle, and goes off to eat it by himself. Some animals prefer the leaves, others the flowers. Each animal has an individual eating habit with the thistle. After a good feed, a bit of a head scratch, tickles, and a nap. Wood plays an important part in the gorilla's diet, especially during the rainy season when it's more soft and palpable. The animals go to a great deal of trouble to break down branches such as these, or even trees. He now extracts the outer bark so as to get to the inner pulp. The jaw muscles are tremendous, therefore the need of the sagittal crest for jaw attachment, muscle attachment. Note the marking of the incisors. Wood may be competitive. This young male leaves his piece of wood only to be, have it taken over by a younger animal who's been just waiting for this chance. However, the size of the wood creates a bit of a problem for him <laughs> due to his own size, but persistence will out, especially with the aid of a foot. The high alpine zone exists around 11,500 feet. It's an area of poor gorilla food filled with giant sonatio and giant lobelias. There is competition in this area for food. A gorilla group has gathered. However, they are aware the silverbacks charge into their bulk as he wants a prime feeding spot. They regather so to begin to dig for roots. I have never seen gorillas using tools. They would dig for roots as you or I would. The younger animals take the wood root discards from their mothers, and all are quite content with a meager fare offered. The only other animals I've seen up here are buffaloes, which frequent the high alpine meadows. Well, that was a good appetizer now for the main chorus. It's an unhappy thought to consider that maybe man's encroachment into all the lower areas may force the gorillas to live within this altitude and this bleak, desolate, harsh zone where food is so scarce and The, cl the climate, the weather, all is so inclement. Climate, climate. By far, the majority of the gorilla's day is spent in the herbaceous zone on open, sunny slopes. Here is a chain session of grooming, not frequently seen amongst gorilla, but far more common amongst chimpanzees. Note the dexterity and concentration of this large silverback as he performs his toilet. His broad, stumpy feet are needed in order to support his great weight he may weigh up to 400 pounds. The hair is parted orally and manually. 
I have never observed external parasites on the gorilla, only the dead skin flakes, bits of scab, or foliage debris. The hair of the mountain gorilla is much longer and darker than that of the lowland gorilla, undoubtedly an adaptation to the altitude. The rough hands of this female grasp her infant to her for a very intense session of grooming. Gorilla infants don't particularly like to be groomed, and they're always wiggling. That's the tight grip. Her hands are not really typical of gorilla. It seems to be a characteristically only of her, and it is all over her body, the skin condition. I hope she finds what she's looking for. Well, that's what being a mother is all about. <laughs> Since the younger infants don't much care for grooming, the mothers do take advantage of them when they are concentrating on other activities. Here a young infant goes for a nursing session, and mother takes a look at her, and she is a bit of a mess, and decides that it would be a good chance to orally groom her. The young infants are very secure in the love and affection of their mothers and receive much attention. It's often very seldom that you will see an infant try and return any attention to its mother. Here the infant decides that it will groom the mother, but does so in a rather lackadaisical, unexperienced manner, and has a very short term of attention. Young females without infants of their own will often pin down younger animals so that they can groom them. Here a young female is practicing on a younger male. She won't be able to pin him down much longer. In about six years, he'll be a silverback, the name so-called because eventually their backs will slowly gray, then become totally silver, denoting their status as a dominant animal. He seems to be enjoying her tension. The day resting periods are long and leisurely affairs, Locations are determined by a maximum sun slant. Day resting periods occur around midday. To build a nest may take up to five minutes. Carefully selected vines and stalks are bent in around the animal's body to make a good rim. The younger animals seem to have a bit of trouble with foliage that seems to have a mind of its own. Therefore, it has to be put in place bodily. <laughs> this animal is far more experienced as evidenced by her firm and even comfortable appearing nest. She relaxes Snacks are readily available. He's still at it. <laughs> oh, what a life. <laughs> Young... <laughs> <laughs> They begin play nest at the age of two years, but sometimes their initial flimsy efforts need more practice. <laughs> <laughs> the
There's also a pattern of spatial distribution in the day nest. If an animal really wants to sleep, then he'll go slightly apart from the others. While they sleep, I work. And typing up each daily observations must be done the same day that they are taken. The recording of all camp activities is, is really a very important part of the research. One of, the, one of the things that we do, we term nose prints. We have nose print boards identifying every animal within all the groups on Mount Vesoki and other mountains. The nose print is the linear indentations above the nostrils and in no two animals are they alike. They would be the equivalent of the human fingerprint. In this manner, new students coming to camp can easily recognize the animals with which they will work. Also, the nose print boards and photographs are important in following the maturation of individuals. Mothers and their offsprings may have similar nose prints at first, but as the animal matures, its own linear indentations become more and more announced. By knowing not only our own animals, we also know others. This enabled us to identify a silverback from another mountain who had been killed by poachers. His death was only because the poachers wanted Sumu, a black magic potent, which is obtainable, according to these people, only from the silverbacks. I have undertaken a skeletal collection. Um, we have gotten over 60 skulls from Zaire and all throughout the mountain range. The majority of these animals have been killed by poachers for Sumu. The skulls are then sent to the Smithsonian where they are analyzed thoroughly. It's not a task I enjoy. Another aspect of the work of course, is the conservation efforts, which must go on. When walking through the forest, I come across often Ikibuga, which is a hut in which dwell either poachers or cattle people. The poachers, of course, speak for themselves. They slaughter other animals. The cattle people bring in herds illegally into the park, herds up to 400 head, which absolutely devastate an area. The Rwandese park guards work very hard trying to protect their large park. At the moment, they are small in number. Each time I go back to camp, I bring along um, extra supplies and equipment for the guards, actually from Sunny Surplus here in Washington. And this gives the men a wee bit of incentive uh, to help them to go out into the park on their patrols. Every month, I do have patrols, and the men go out and do capture poachers and cattlemen, which are then the men are then jailed for a short time in the nearest town, which is 19 miles away. On Mount Vesoki, there are a total of 96 gorilla, which live in nine different groups. This count includes seven silverbacks who do not live within a group structure. The silverbacks will eventually form their own subgroups by kidnapping females from other groups, and the females go along readily. Around my camp area, there are two main study groups, groups four and five. 
Each of these consists of 10 animals. Group five, pictured here, had 16 animals within their group last year. Two died and four were kidnapped by other groups. On this occasion, group five is going to reclaim one of their females. For two days, they move steadily toward group four. Group four is waiting for them on a ridge not too far away. Uncle Bert, the silverback of group four, is communicating his tension by hoot series and chest beats. Bravado, the young female, who had been kidnapped and taken away from group five, is shown here playing with the youngsters of group four, totally unaware of the situation she has created. The Hoot series is a vocalization only used between communicating silverbacks a type of vocal probe, whilst the chest beat indicates Silverback's dominance within his group. All of the group members are extremely wary of Uncle Bert's movements, the strutting walk, a display which magnifies his size and indicates again his dominance within his group. However, as Beethoven approaches, Uncle Bert considers it more prudent to retreat partially. Beethoven in the strutting walk, deliberating what his next move will be and the situation now is highly tense one. Beethoven sought to enter the group to grab his female. Now as the tension increases, overt aggression is avoided as both silverbacks increase the distance between themselves. The female cowers in submission. Beethoven seeks to grab her one more time. Uncle Bert checks him. Then Beethoven, being the more dominant animal, literally herds bravado out of, out of group four and down the ridge toward his own group. Uncle Bert waits a few minutes before he follows. <laughs> this interaction had occurred on the edge of their home range. And now, since the interaction is over with, and Uncle Bert needs more experience before he goes back, he heads his group back toward the core of their range. Both groups four and five have a range area of eight square kilometers. Their average travel per day is two kilometers, though they've been known to go up to five. The range expands yearly, especially in the saddle area, which is now being protected. Wait for me, fellas. The silverback is the one responsible for both the speed and direction of movement. But this doesn't mean that he has to uh, travel in the lead of the group. Female disputes along the trail are commonplace. Here a dominant female seeks to get by a more subordinate animal for the right of way. The subordinate animal is like the pickle in the middle. 
with the dominant silverback coming down on her, she can only try and stay out of his way. When the two groups are far apart, an air of relaxation prevails in group four. Here a female comes to the observers with her infant held in a dorsal position. She held it in a ventral position during the interaction, one of maximum security for the infant. The white tail tuft of the infant denotes it to other gorilla as an animal who needs protection. a defenseless animal. The group all cluster together with the exception of the blackback, or yet to be mature male. He stays on the edges of the group in a role rather similar to that of a watchdog. Doesn't look it. The group members play happily all very relaxed now. And the watchdog. <laughs> Mutual grooming and play is the main object now. Even the silverback may become playful. Now he's deliberating some kind of move, and he enters into the center of the group. They're very wary of his entrance. He spots the black back on the edge of the group and grabs a bit of foliage and stands upright and chest beats, gives a run, and whams the black back on the back. All done in good spirits, and the black back doesn't mind a bit. I'd like to introduce you to the silverback, Uncle Bert. A lovely, lovely animal in his prime, approximately 20 years of age, mated for life to the older females. He was one of three silverbacks when I met the group in 67. One died and the second one left to lead a lone life. The calm consistency of Uncle Bert's leadership has made this a relatively easy group to habituate. When he is ever nervous or uneasy, all the group members reflect this. But as for the most part, he's a very calm animal. One day, however, I chanced to drop my camera lens. It was a noise he hadn't heard, noisy, strange. He became curious, then slightly apprehensive. That's what's known as a carry-out dinner. One day Uncle Bert met me with a very sharp alarm bark, quite unlike him, and then he retreated. I looked around and found a pink-eared infant born that night. I had no idea the mother, Flossie, had been pregnant. The gestation period for the gorilla is between eight and a half to nine months. She was very shy at first and then allowed us to get a bit of a glimpse of the baby. Gorilla infants at the age, at the age of two hours are able to hang independent of their mother's aid in a ventral position. By the age of seven months, Cleo was a typical gorilla baby with a crown of reddish hair, spindly and uncoordinated. <laughs> she depended upon her mother for warmth, protection, nourishment, and transportation. Perhaps because of the long period of dependency of the gorilla infant on the mother, there have not been any intervals less than three years when the mother have had infants of their own. A great playground. The mother's body provides mounds and legs and arms to climb on and hair to pull.
the patience of the gorilla mother is commendable. Cleo suffered an eye injury at the age of seven months. It appeared very serious, but now has healed completely. After a good play session, a bit of a snooze. Since Cleo is in proximity with her mother most of the time, she must rely on the approach of other infants and juveniles to learn how to play. She enjoys entering into a playing circle, but does so a little bit on the sloppy side. They're always aware of her, and they're very gentle when she is around. Cleo's mother, Flossie, keeps an eye on the play and has been observed to jerk Cleo back to her if the play chance to get too rough. I can take care of myself, Ma. Petula is another female of group four, the most subordinate adult within the group, also the most permissive with her two-year-old son, Augustus. Nursing periods last up to one minute, and it is usually the mother who terminates them. Augustus is the only gorilla I've ever seen hand clap. He is a unique individual, a study in perpetual motion. Jungle gyms provide Augustus with no end of entertainment. He's an extremely inventive animal and has all kinds of combinations of, of legs and arms needed to manipulate himself in and out of branches. There is scarcely a tree within the range of Group 4 that doesn't bear witness to Augustus's play measures and acrobatics. His mother is trying to rest at the base of the tree. Trying. Adult gorillas scarcely ever climb into saplings such as these because of their immense weight. Furthermore, the majority of their foliage is found at ground level. Juveniles and infants, however, spend a great deal of their time in trees, playing for the most part. Whether treed or grounded, Augustus is always on the move. He seldom misses a chance for a play interaction. The repetition in play is common, always coming back for more. The rougher it is, the more he seems to like it. This kind of mock biting is, and hair pulling is the main part 
of play in boxling and wrestling sessions, plus tackling. <laughs> Bottoms up. Sometimes, however, though, one should retreat gracefully. Wait a minute, I'm not through with you. Four-year-old juvenile of group four by the name of Tiger is another very playful and rambunctious animal. By this age, though, his play behavior, especially when alone, has become more stereotyped. For the most part, it consists of strutting walks, chest beating, foliage whacking, all behavior imitative of the adult males. Tiger's mother, Old Goat, so named because of her disposition, is the most dominant animal uh, female within group four. Two years ago, she lost an infant, and after that, reinforced her maternal behavior toward Tiger, allowing him to ride dorsally at an age when most juveniles were quite independent in their travel methods. In other words, she just plain babied him. The bond between Tiger and his mother is very close, but he also reacts and is responded to by many other animals within the group. Here a young female grooms him. Old Goat seeks to spend a great deal of time with Tiger, much more so than is ordinary for the gorilla mother with a uh, juvenile this old. He embraces her when, he, when she comes to him in the forest. The young female in the background seeks to retain their proximity. Tiger begins to groom his mother as a means of social, uh, enforcing their social bond, and the young female self-grooms, an unoffensive manner in which she can retain the proximity of these two dominant animals. Then she moves cautiously into another position so to get closer to Tiger. She, too, then begins to groom him. With all this attention. He's in quite a good position. Young animals such as Tiger may serve as connecting links between social groupings that might not otherwise occur. The silverback, Uncle Bert, leads his group off and all follow without any hesitation. In many primate societies, the trauma of becoming orphaned may be such that the animal loses the will to live. Here, Simba watches Tiger and Augustus play. Simba was orphaned at the age of three years. Prior to her mother's death, she too played readily, especially with Tiger. After that, she became a morose and forlorn figure. Uncle Bert, the silverback, then became her substitute mother, which I thought was most unusual. 
He took her into his night nest, and he protected her against all of the other members of the group, and he groomed her for hours on end. She seemed to become slowly reinforced by his attentions, and she began to tolerate the proximity of other young animals. Slowly, she began to respond in a rather inhibited manner to their invitations to play. However, when she became too annoyed, she would give some temper shrieks, and this would cause Uncle Bert to come running to her immediately. Papoose is a young sub-adult female of six years of group four. Papoose has one interesting personality quirk. She loves to catch a reflection in the camera lens. Well, a girl's got to look her best. She seldom missed an opportunity to do so, which made focusing a bit difficult. Although very much the young lady, Papoose often resorted to tomboy tactics. Tiger was her favorite playmate, so they often played for long times, either wrestling and tackling one another or in the chasing and tag games. The forest foliage made an excellent play, play, playground for tag and hide and go seek games such as this. Often the animals would reverse direction so that the pursuer then became the pursued. A sunny day resting period with most of the youngsters playing, others grooming, and Tiger being attended to by his mother. The vocalization is known as the panting play chuckle which usually accompanies such play. When the group day nest, they rest in a compact area about 20 feet in diameter, which gives, of course, the maximum opportunity for play. Papoose is everyone's favorite playmate. Back to it. When watching this kind of behavior, it is hard to Im imagine that people ever consider gorillas King Kong. There's no energy crisis here. Augustus makes a formidable playmate. What he lacks in size, he makes up in sheer vigor. Papoose tries to divide her time between them, but sometimes it's difficult. Augustus trying to think up a new method of attack. His mother, Petula, looks like an old contemplative furry Buddha. She
She's getting tired. Sometimes she'll mock bite in a means of trying to stop Augustus or Tiger, or to at least slow them down a bit. Any sudden movement on the part of one animal in the group causes alarm. Here, Flossie leaves with Cleo in a dorsal position. The reason for her exit is the entrance of Digit, the one black back in the group who has remained on the edge of the group. Digit has inadvertently disrupted the play session. Tiger gives him a reassurance gesture, and Papoose starts to groom his leg, recognizing his dominancy. Digit, as the lone black back, has no peers. The three animals with whom he grew up, all females, have been kidnapped into other groups. At the age of seven years, he might like or welcome play as a social interaction, but doesn't have the opportunity. He takes over the nest of the dominant female old goat. (laughs) Taking over the nest of a dominant animal increases the dominancy of a more subordinate one and enhances their status. Perhaps because he has lost all of his peers, or maybe because he is in that special classification of young males, Digit has been remarkably uh, tolerant toward observers and even appears to welcome their presence. He is also especially attracted to objects we take out into the field, such as camera lenses, notebooks, and gloves. Now, if he only had the other one, he'd be all set. Smell plays an important part in the examination of any alien objects. If it attracts him, he picks it up and he smells it. However, it's not very useful, especially if there's only one. Things are handled in a gentle manner, never roughly thrown about. Seemingly pleased with his daring, Digit drops it and runs off with a chest beat. Slowly, slowly, over the years, about a year and a half, all the animals of Group 4 were approaching very closely, simply because of their own initiative and the sense of curiosity. To have finally been accepted by the wild gorillas was its own reward, and the thrill of each day's contact is one that will never diminish. Taking notes at times like this, these were a little bit distracting. I just didn't know which way to look. The noise of the scratching served to appease him and make him more comfortable, though, as if he needed it. (laughs) I offered him another alien object. 
And as always, of course, the smell had to come first. But since he couldn't carry it off with him, he wasn't interested. The calm and ease with which Digit walks between myself and the photographer is an indication of the trust that he has placed in us. Sometimes it's hard to know who's the observer and who's the observed. What will he learn next? <laughs> so long, folks.